Howdy, folks. Thanks for making it out. How's the, uh, how's the day been so far? Awesome. Um, obviously, a, a quick thanks to Peter and everyone involved, all the volunteers um, with Silicon Valley Code Camp. I think this is my fourth or fifth year. Um, and I started off not knowing how to code the very first time I came, and here I am giving a talk. So um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> maybe you're in the wrong talk, or maybe this is a great place. Um, but my topic today is seven days to build an iPhone app. Um, and I think the only topic more, I think the only challenge bigger than building an app in seven days is describing how you do it in 45 minutes. So I'm going to do my very best. You're going to have lots of questions. Um, there's going to be a ton of resources that I make available to you all probably tomorrow. Um, but there'll be information at the end of the presentation so that you guys can get any information that you want. Um, very likely turning this content into a book. You'll see there's a little bit of a book structure already. And so um, if you want, feel free to sign up at the end uh, of the presentation on the link. And I'll make sure that you guys get a free PDF of it when it comes out. My name is Andrew Belay. And I'm going to do introductions uh, just a little bit later in the presentation. But the objective today is uh, for you to walk out of here a lot more comfortable with what it takes to build a mobile application. As you'll see, building a mobile app requires a very large number of skills, um, which is rare to find in a single person and often requires a team. Uh, this is really the core reason of why there are so many terrible apps in the App Store and why it often takes an army of developers to build um, something halfway decent. So I'm just going to jump right in here for, for a few minutes, and I'll introduce myself and get to know you guys a little bit better and cover the agenda in just a few minutes. Um, but I want to make sure that everyone's in the right room first. So we're talking about mobile today and how to build an app very quickly. Um, I just want to briefly cover the history of information transfer technologies. This is the brief history. Um, spoken language, uh, after grunting, gave humanity the ability to transfer information as far as we could be heard. And written language gave information uh, more permanence. Um, but replication and distribution was labor intensive and slow, since everything was handwritten. The printing press solved some of these issues, uh, but it wasn't until the internet that literally billions of people could share information with one another. Uh, and now the internet is sitting in your pocket. I think I have three connected devices just right here that I brought with me for this presentation. Um, and all of these devices have millions of times more processing power and memory and storage than what it took for us to put a man on the moon. So the world has changed, and the age of mobile has really only just begun. The opportunities are endless for anyone with a vision and some thick skin. So what we're here to talk about today is a stack of technology that has been built over many, many, many centuries, really. Um, and we're just in that top layer. So remember that we are on the shoulders of giants. Um, and hopefully, that, hopefully this is why you're here, to, to, to build a, a smartphone app. Um, and hopefully it's better, uh, or leads to a better use case than, than what's going on here on the right. This is Snapchat, of course. Um, with a dog supposedly taking a selfie. The, um, the next three slides, well, every year Mary Meeker at um, Kleiner Perkins Caulfield Byers, one of the most prestigious venture capital firms in uh, Silicon Valley, every year she gives a dense 60-minute talk about the state of the internet. And 2015 is a bit of a landmark year because the internet hit a sort of meaningful milestone in 1995 um, it kind of got big in 95. And so the 20-year anniversary uh, offered, offers us a, a moment to reflect on how much technology has changed modern society. So in the left, you can see the public internet companies as of December 1995. And you can see it, um, really just a few names uh, that you might recognize. And you can see how small these companies were in relative terms to today's companies, Netscape being the largest at uh, about $5.5 billion in market cap. Um, here is May 2015, and not a single company uh, is so small as Netscape was at the time. Um, I don't know how many multiples the total market cap is here, but the world has fundamentally changed, um, and the internet is an enormous part of our economy. This next slide clearly demonstrates um, another shift that's happened post-internet, uh, which is a shift in attention from desktop environments to mobile devices. So the green bars here show hours on mobile devices, and the blue shows a declining uh, attention span on desktop um, or fixed devices. So mobile is very important. 
Um, by the way, I recommend if, if you haven't seen her entire deck, you sh really should check it out. It's um, at kpcb.com slash internet trends. It's a really fantastic read. It'll take you probably two hours to go through. You can find her talk. That's amazing as well. Um, this third slide here and the last one of this series uh, shows another clear shaft, shift in attention. Um, millennials, apparently 87% of millennials are saying that uh, their smartphone never leaves their side night or day. Um, and 80% are saying that the first thing they do in the morning is reach for their smartphone. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but I am still making coffee first thing in the morning. And maybe that's because uh, I'm an old fashioned Texas boy, born and raised. I moved to Silicon Valley after earning my chemical engineering degree and labor arts degree from UT Austin. After working at what was then the largest uh, company in the world, ExxonMobil, I decided to head west and attend Stanford for my master's in what's called management science and engineering. With this trifecta of uh, education, you know, a very hardcore engineering degree, labor arts degree, and what's kind of a, an MBA for engineers, I set out to do what everyone sets out to do here, uh, which is start my first company. Mobile was where the attention was just shifting to, you know, five and six years ago. Um, and so I was trying to skate to where the puck was and things have gone um, fairly well in that process. And over the last five years, I've built dozens of apps um, explicitly on the iOS platform. And here are just a few of those. Um, I don't know if you'd recognize many of these and certainly UCSF and Stanford. Um, some of these are startups, some of them are not. Um, and there's a whole bunch of enterprise plays that I'm not really able to discuss. So moving on to the agenda, um, we've already done a bit of introduction and now I wanna get to know you a little bit. Um, so I'll keep this short because I know this part's kind of boring for you all sometimes, but can everyone just raise their hand? For real, everyone. Okay, uh, so put your hand down if you consider yourself an expert iOS developer. So everyone has to start with their hands up first. So if you consider yourself an expert iOS developer, put your hand down, so like one hand, okay. Uh, put your hand down if you consider yourself a beginning or intermediate iOS developer. Okay, so like a third of the room. What about if you're just a mobile developer in general? Okay, a handful of Android or other folks. Uh, what if you're just a developer in general? Okay, and so if you still have your hand up, raise it real high. Raise your, uh, so lower your hand if you manage a team of developers. Well, none there, okay. Uh, put your hand down if you consider yourself technical. Okay, who's got their hand up still? I don't wanna pick on you too much, but I wanna learn about who you are. Anyone? Okay, perfect. Okay, so now put your hands up if you're an executive at a well-funded startup or a company that's interested in going mobile. Nice, that's what I want to see, okay, I got one, cool. Um, put your hand up if you're an entrepreneur at a not so well-funded startup or company. Okay. Uh, put your hand up if you're a student. About 10 students. Okay, so who, what is everyone else? Just shout it out. Government, developer. One more time. Developer. How many developers do we have? Raise your hand. And uh, working at companies of 500 or so or smaller? Okay. Okay, that's great. Uh, so who will benefit most in this talk? Um, of course, existing iOS developers um, are gonna learn peripheral skills to the ones they already have. Android and other non-iOS developers uh, looking to learn more about iOS um, can benefit quite a bit. And uh, product managers looking for ways to shorten and improve dev cycles. And then any sort of developer um, who's looking to get into mobile, of course. So regardless of who you are and what you wanna walk away with today, one thing that I can guarantee that you'll walk away with is a process that you can confidently use to build your mobile apps. And at the end of my talk today, I'll share, uh, I'll definitely stick around for questions. I think we'll have a few at the end. Hopefully we have time. Um, and I'll give anyone in the room uh, these slides and a free copy of the book that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and also answer any questions. And I'm happy to stick around for a while afterwards as soon as they boot us out of the room or head to lunch. Uh, a few caveats. So I've already mentioned iOS several times. Um, my universe is iOS. I only work with Apple products. Um, the content should be nearly 100% transferable. Um, so if you're in another camp, 
it doesn't really matter. Um, just mentally replace iOS with whatever it is you code on and Apple with Google. Um, I make iOS apps because they're typically where people want to start, especially when they're prototyping, and um, then they often port over to Android. And of course, Android apps tend to actually be a bit more challenging to develop these days because of the fragmented nature of the hardware space. Um, I've also have no experience with any graphics heavy gaming. So while I think that, again, the principles will be hello, very applicable, not a space I'm familiar with at all. I think you'll be able to pick out the things that are very useful, um, but I have no experience there. And I'm not gonna teach you any coding at all, uh, despite the fact that I'm a self-taught coder. You can go learn all that stuff um, from Paul Haggerty's lectures at Stanford, or I think it's CS193P is used to be the class at least, uh, Apple's WWDC lectures and videos, um, or the iPhone Stack Overflow section, whatever. So those things you can look uh, up on your own. So the question I get all the time is how is this even possible? How can you build an app in seven days? I um, mean, everyone here knows that building good software is hard, so you'd think that doing it on an insanely short timeline like this would make it harder, and in some cases you would be absolutely wrong, especially if you have the right process. So even with the amazing people on my team at my company, uh, we would fail every time without our amazing process. Um, and occasionally we try to build an app uh, for fun on the side without using our process, and inevitably it takes three, four, five times longer, sometimes 10 if we really screw it up. Um, so we tend to follow our process, especially when we have client money on the line. Um, we like to keep things simple. Our process is really only a few steps, um, although it does uh, contain dozens of sub-steps. Um, the first few activities are what I like to call smart brain, and the last few steps are what I like to call dumb brain, uh, meaning that we try to make all the decisions we can up front, and then we really try to crank away at the code base and get feedback on the back end. So I want to give a brief uh, overview of the process. Um, this is uh, one of several diagrams I show you that kind of slice and dice the process a few different ways. Um, first point is that 10,080 minutes sounds like plenty of time to execute on something amazing, but uh, seven days can really evaporate in no time flat, as I'm sure you've all experienced while working on a project. That's why the first two steps of our process, define and design, are dedicated to making decisions. While the third step, architecture, uh, also involves a ton of decision making, the nature of the decisions are highly technical. Once we're uh, into development mode, that uh, fourth step, we have really made, or at least our objective is to have made 95% of all the decisions that we'll need to make for the entire rest of the process. Um, and any decisions we, we have to make at that point, we typically consider a mistake, take note of it, and come back at the end of the process to figure out what went wrong and why we were having to make decisions that late in the game. Development should really be pure execution. Step five allows us to launch the app, market it if necessary, or if that's what our clients want. Um, and then we roll into step six, which is maintenance and iterating while gathering feedback. The other diagram I like to show that explains our process fairly well, although this is not you know, a very official diagram, it shows that the main movement of our process is to go from very vague and ambiguous into the concrete and actionable. And we first do that by getting precise, and then we get more technical. And it's a bit iterative, um, but we have to get precise about what it is we would like to build before we even attempt to build it. And this is, I think, the classic mistake that folks make when first sitting down to develop software, whether it's for themselves or for someone else. Okay, so chapter one, define and plan. Define what your objectives are for your app and what problem you're trying to solve for your users. Prepare for the rest of the process. At the first two steps, Sorry, in the first two steps, we have to translate a vision for an app into a precise design that we can then build with the rest of our process. Some teams, some, some of my clients, come to me with nothing but an idea, um, occasionally just a sentence or two, and others come with completely pixel-perfect designs. Um, but most come, most come with some sort of paper sketches um, and a ton of ideas that are festering in their head. And so we always have to start with where our clients are. Right? So if you're taking this back to your work environment, you have to think about where are the starting points for the ideas that are coming in the door to you? But regardless, the first thing to do is to establish a goal. And in many cases, um, it's a business goal. Um, so what are the most common goals for apps? Um, typically, I see a lot of uh, startups and entrepreneurs, and so they're trying to disrupt a space. Oftentimes we have smaller mom and pop businesses and they're trying to um, extend their existing web business 
into a mobile space. And then, of course, we see very large companies <coughs> who are trying to reinvent themselves in a mobile space. So these are companies that maybe fell in that 1995 list and are trying to modernize themselves uh, 20 years later. Um, what are a few bad goals for uh, an application? Well, anything that's vague or not actionable is going to be very difficult to measure on the back end and very difficult to evaluate. And so you won't actually know if you've succeeded. The next step is to really understand the, la the app landscape. And this is just good old fashioned you know, research. And unfortunately it means a lot of tapping on your phone to see what's going on, a lot of internet research to see who's in the space that you're interested in looking at. In, a, in the startup world that I come from, there, we often talk about three kinds of risks, uh, people, technology, and markets. I'm gonna just drop people for the sake of this discussion and focus briefly on technology and more extensively on markets. The best markets to go after in the mobile space are blue ocean markets. And I'll have some resources on what a blue ocean is and what a red ocean is in the, uh, um, the files that I give you afterwards. Um, but basically a, a blue ocean is exactly what it sounds like. It's a space in the app ecosystem that's not as crowded as the rest of the space. So 2015 is not such a great time. Well, 2013 would have been a really terrible time to start your photo sharing app company because a whole bunch had just been acquired the market was completely flooded with sort of me too apps that were all doing the same thing. And actually now might be an interesting time to do something novel with some of the new technologies that are coming out, both on the hardware and software front um, in the photo, sh uh, photo sharing space. A red market, uh, sorry, a red ocean is exactly what it sounds like. It's red from blood and there's lots of sharks. So typically because of the nature of the app environment, you want to avoid these red markets. Um, and you want to really try, to try to find a new market, so a blue ocean. That way you're not competing with the big boys. Um, so there's a handful of ways to do that, and one of them is actually technology. So I'm pretty excited about the, the new larger form tablet and the stylus that's come out. It's gonna be really interesting to see if that set of devices can replace um, some three and $4,000 Wacom devices that high-end illustrators use. That's gonna be really interesting to see what happens there. So that's a place, that, that's a case where the technology of these tablets may have finally caught up with that specialty device that Wacom's been making for quite some, quite some time. So in the App Store, the main risk isn't technology, but market risk. How do you get people to download, love, and tell others um, whom they have influence over to download your app? That should be your main concern when evaluating markets. The, the, uh, the short answer is to build the very best app you can build and then get initial users and then make your app so good that those initial users tell other people that ha they have influence over to then download your app and the cycle repeats. Um, that is the best marketing strategy uh, still, I mean, I think in general for any product, but um, certainly in the app space. It's the, here, look at this cool app I found. Jimmy, download it. That is the best way to get someone else to download your app. It's word of mouth marketing. So the next, the next thing that's extremely important in picking a space to uh, build an app in is to find a real problem. And it's really difficult to understand what a real problem might be because I didn't think the, Snap, the, the space that Snapchat was in was solving a real problem, but clearly it is for whatever hundreds of millions of users or how many people are there. So one thing to keep in mind when defining the app uh, that you'd like to build is just because it doesn't solve your particular problem doesn't mean it doesn't solve someone else's problem. Clearly there are a lot of companies out there making a ton of money, making a huge impact, doing things that we don't necessarily understand. So keep that in mind. Um, maybe those are spaces to stare clear of because you don't maybe understand them um, or maybe they're places to get smart on. Of course, once you've started to find a space that you like, you definitely wanna brainstorm some solutions. I have a lot of material on this online that'll be available. And of course, doing some uh, need finding and validation. I um, have some great resources uh, that came out of Stanford, both out of the design school there and out of IDEO. Um, and of course, at the beginning of your app is a good time to think about monetization, especially if this is a business uh, initiative. There are lots of apps that aren't financially motivated and that's a great um, goal for an app as well. Uh, but if you are looking to sustain something long-term or make money doing it, it's pretty good to think about monetization fairly early 
um, although you have a lot of wiggle room on the back end. And finally, the last thing you want to do in this stage is really define a roadmap. This is important because in the brainstorming phase, you're going to come up with a lot more ideas than you know what to do with. And this can feel really overwhelming. So if you're able to say, look, we've captured these ideas and we've put them in a roadmap, and we understand that we're going to try to tackle idea 14 in three months, that really helps keep a team together if that's um, what you're working, if you're working with other people. Um, but it also helps to just organize things and keep things stable and calm while you're building. Okay, so this next slide shows a tool that we use internally. Um, uh, we have our own blueprints. The name of my company is MetaNear, it's Meta Engineer. And we built this series of blueprints, and this is one of the early ones, uh, to really help our clients get ideas out of their head and onto paper to clarify their vision. So this is the first design uh, sheet. And you can't read any of this on the right, so I've blown it up here. Um, we ask <clears throat> questions in a few main categories, vision, uh, user story, opportunity, and success metrics. You can probably read faster than I can talk, but we, of course, want to know what the company's vision and mission is, and we especially want to know what their key insights are. Um, this is where you get a strategic advantage, when you know something that someone else doesn't. And I can't go into a lot of details of my past clients, but this can be, I recently saw a case where someone understood something about um, ACA, the Affordable Care Act, that really no one else has quite figured out yet around the way um, reimbursements will be done for certain kinds of healthcare. That is a huge market that these guys are stumbling into, not stumbling into, very intentionally running headfirst into, and after building their app, they have really started to raise some serious money and have since hired uh, several full-time engineers to continue progressing forward. <clears throat> so this key insights thing is really important. Whatever sector you're in now, you know very well. You are an expert, and you should leverage that, or that would be my advice, leverage that to find a space to build an app in. Of course, you have to be addressing a real pain. We've sort of discussed that earlier. And then user stories, you really want to create, we often create personas to understand you know, three or four different kinds of people and users. And really, we make up a whole life story for them. You know, how old they are, how many kids they have, how long their commute is, you know, how they spend their time, how they spend their money, et cetera. And we put the, the app that we want to build, the experience that we want to build into their lives. We insert it in there and see if it makes sense. And then we try to go find people that actually are those personas and verify our assumptions. We, of course, want to start to talk about what can the app really do for this user? What's the business opportunity? Who's the competition, if any? And what their competitive advantage is? Uh, and then, of course, we like to get su success metrics on the table early here so that we have something to measure later on in the process so we know if we succeeded or failed or whether we need to do something else. The key part about this set of blueprints is that we're really focused on the company and, and its vision, not so much on the app yet. That's the next slide, uh, which is our second design um, blueprint, where we really focus on features. This is quite simple. We just go <clears throat> for five must-have features, five nice-to-haves, and how many dream, fe dream features you might want. We like to come back with a different colored pen. We do all this with felt tip markers, these first few uh, blueprints. These are full-size paper blueprints that we print out. I have. Um, some examples over here that I can show you afterwards. I can't present these because they have um, intellectual property on them that's not mine, but um, we have some really nice examples of how this process actually works if you want to swing by afterwards. <clears throat> the point of this section is to really get down to the heart of what this app does. No app needs 100,000 features, right? The heart of every app is just a few things. We built an app recently that um, required, and I have that side of Blueprints, uh, photo journaling, HIPAA compliance, uh, messaging, questionnaires, and real-time messaging, like real-time chat. And those were our five features. And had we bit off a lot more than that, we would have been in big trouble. You know, it happened to be our third HIPAA compliant app, so that wasn't the hardest part um, of making the app work. Um, but had we had any more than that, we probably wouldn't have hit our seven-day deadline. So it's really important to get the scoping correct which is one of the key skills in the define and design section of this process. Chapter two, design. Design is a tool to solve a problem. In this section, we'll learn to design a mobile app that, serves, that solves both your user's problem and your objective for building an app. We need to talk about what design is um, because there's a lot of confusion about this. I have to deal with this constantly. You saw in my background, I have no formal design training but I am a designer because designers 
use t design is a tool to solve problems with a set of constraints. And there are several different forms of design, graphic design, interface design, interaction design, information design. And I'll use this, um, uh, this button to open a door uh, automatically as an example. So the graphic design is what you see on the front of the button, right? The symbol of a person in a wheelchair and then the characters that say how to operate this. That's the graphic design. The letters are <clears throat> of a certain size. They're in all caps so that they can be read, but read slowly because all caps forces you to slow down. Uh, they're of a certain color that's very consistent with um, other notations of this kind. The interface design is different though, and there's a lot of confusion around this, especially when we get to mobile devices. The interface is a button itself, right? It's this panel that can be pushed. That's the interface, but the interaction is pushing it. And it's not only when you push it, it pushes back, right? And this is what Apple's doing with the Force Touch or whatever they've renamed it to recently. Um, and the information design, you don't see at all. That's what's going on behind the scenes. It's sending the signal to the motors that are opening the door. Um, if you'd like to get a quick primer on design, I highly rec recommend uh, Mike Mont I think it's uh, Monteros. Uh, is how you say his last name. <clears throat> design is a job. He also has a podcast called Let's Make Mistakes, which has a very memorable uh, uh, little girl on the front smoking a cigarette. Um, so if you're into podcasts, check that out. It's, it's both entertaining and uh, very valuable. Um, and he has a lot of great talks, some of which I can't say the names of because they have uh, swear words in them. One piece of advice I will give you is to stop saying UI UX, right? UI obviously can have three different meanings over here, just in the four different kinds of design I've identified here. And UX, which is short for what people mean user experience, is kind of a BS term because you can't really control a user's experience. All you can do is put product in front of them and they then have an experience with or without your assistance. So that's one just quick tip that I would give you to maybe reorient the way you think about design. So of course, the first step to designing is understanding what it is, which we just covered. Um, and you're gonna need some prototyping and rough sketching skills. Um, something that I did when I wanted to really get my drawing skills up to the next level was I went onto Instagram, which I'm not a big user of, and I found two uh, local artists in San Francisco that I liked. And I sent them a direct message and said, hey, I really like your style. Can I pay you 30 bucks an hour to teach me to draw? And I wish I had dug up um, some of the, the before and after sketches I did just after my first session. But someone who's drawing, you know, attempting to draw professionally or attempting to be an artist professionally can really teach someone who's not an artist like me a ton in an hour. So you can sit down, have a session or two a month, do a little bit of homework in between, and you can really make a huge dent in your ability to communicate visually with a pen and paper. And as you've figured out already, that's how we do the bulk of our work, with, with a marker and huge sheets of paper. It's very compelling, especially when I'm trying to sell a client on what we do, to sit down and draw what they're talking about and get what's in their head out on paper. Of course, wireframes and mockups, and depending on how you define these, they can mean a lot of different things, are, are nice to have. There's all sorts of tools out there. Envision, Sketch3, those are some that come to mind. But you know what? I made this entire presentation in Keynote, and I've done fantastic wireframes in Keynote. Um, so you don't have to make these things complicated. And for, for each of these things in, throughout this whole presentation, I'm gonna have a list of tools um, that just too much information to include here, but I'll include it online so that you can follow back up and see that there are a huge amount of tools out there that can help you perform each of the skills necessary without having to be an artist or without having to be a developer. Of course, graphic design, um, something that is gonna be necessary to build an app in most cases. Apple gives you a lot to work with. Um, I'm sure Android does as well. There's of course a lot of libraries out there and folks that have made packets um, that you can import into your project to get running with. Um, it's always nice to have someone who understands how to use Illustrator and, Adobe and the rest of the Adobe suite fairly well. Um, we often do a lot of the graphic design ourselves when our clients come to us. It just depends how busy they are, or sorry, how, how quickly they need to run and whether they have uh, graphic design done already. Um, there are great websites where you can buy, <clears throat> again, huge packets of assets uh, at very low cost that I would check out and I'll include in the notes. And of course, scoping is a major part of this uh, section. So really culling the design way down so that you can actually build what it is you've designed. <clears throat> Here are the blueprints for this section. Um, you can see there's a lot more going on than the last section. And that's because we're really starting to break down what this app is all about. 
So we do a cr very crude pass on what the screens and flow of the app look like and how the user sort of navigates from one section to another. We also want to ask our client to identify two hypotheses that they'd like to test with this version of their app. And we typically force them to identify two or three priorities um, in an order. There's a little debate going on on the internet right now about the word priorities. Um, I guess it didn't actually exist. Priority, priority was singular, and somehow we made it plural over the last 100 years. But regardless, we ask them to prioritize their two or three priorities so that we can make decisions on their behalf once we start to do development. Because we don't want, in our case, clients involved in the decision-making process, because there shouldn't be a decision-making process once we get into development. So we need to understand what they're thinking about their app so that we can make the small decisions on their behalf. Of course, if we run into a major issue um, that's unanticipated, we uh, re-involve them. <clears throat> but we need to know the company and the app and the objectives well enough to make decisions. Of course, we need a pressing deadline uh, for the work that we do. Um, we also turn around here on, on this sheet and draw the very first launch experience. This is incredibly important. One of the most recent apps I built, we spent just as much time building the entire rest of the app as we did building the first user experience. Because um, as we said earlier, when you're marketing your app, when you're getting your app out there and launching it, you're gonna bring in an initial set of users. Um, a lot of times you're gonna twist your friend's arms or your company is going to deploy it as a beta internally and people aren't necessarily gonna wanna use it because they're busy and their attention is elsewhere. And so if you can't keep them engaged with the app, especially in that first experience, they'll never return and they certainly won't tell other people. So the onboarding for apps has become insanely important because you can throw money to bring new users in, but if you can't keep them in because they don't understand how to use your app, you're throwing that money away. The other thing we do, I'll go back here, is in this bottom left corner, we just do a quick sketch, um, if the client doesn't have it, of uh, their logo, their icon, uh, the launch image, which is what kind of what you see after you tap the tile, um, and the colors they want to use, et cetera. We also like to identify any special vocabulary. We made an app for um, dietitians to, to uh, converse with obese individuals recently, and there was a lot of vocabulary that we needed to learn there, and that vocabulary got woven into the technical architecture so that we could be consistent with the language that they're using that's non-technical but very precise. We also start to make any technical notes for later when we bring in our architect and senior developer. The next set of designs um, is really a much more in-depth set of drawings, and I had some of these on the very first slide, the cover slide. Um, and this is where we've now abandoned our fat-tipped markers, and we've gone to pretty fine pens. Um, if you want to see what we use uh, afterwards, I've got a few in my bag and, and one in my pocket. You know, they're fine-tipped pens, um, and we're continuing as we iterate through the design process to get higher and higher resolution. So these are still the low res, but the, uh, the drawings here were very crude in this top left box, done with a fat marker. We do that very intentionally uh, because we don't want to get too detailed too early. We want to make sure we've got the heart and, si and spirit of the app right before we start getting really detailed. I have a great example of that um, if you want to see afterwards. So these boxes are um, really very free form and we focus on sketching each screen in a lot more detail than we previously have. We start trying to represent state, which is something I should have listed here. So if the app, if the user's in the app for the very first time, there may be no data. And so what do we show in that first experience versus if they're coming into the app for the thousandth time, what do we show? There's a lot of things to think about in terms of state. Um, we, we start to highlight the user interaction elements um, in a different color so that we can know, okay, well this pink box where I've um, highlighted this button, it needs to take the user somewhere. So we start to map those flows between screens. We also do a first pass uh, at labeling our view controllers. Um, how many people know what a view controller is? Oh, like a third of the room, that was like the iOS group. So a view controller is kind of like a screen. It's kind of like what you see. It used to be one-to-one, -one. if you saw it on the, if you, the whole screen was a view controller. Now it's a little bit more complicated, but it's kind of like a collection of views um, that has a little brain attached to it. That's what the controller is. We also start to identify the models um, for each view controller and any show stoppers on the technical front. Um, then we want to perform any very serious technical tests uh, pretty early in the process, in this process, because we're not going to commit to anything to our clients, um, or in, in your case, maybe to your boss, that you don't know you can get done, and you know you can get done on a pretty reasonable timeline. 
We also like to start to think about open source options, um, if that's something we can do. Some of our clients don't allow, don't allow this um, for a variety of reasons. Um, some really like it, we certainly do, because it lets us build more features. And again, we can stand on the, the shoulders of giants. At this point, we take a minute to walk through all the screens that we've designed with both the senior developer and the architect, just to make sure we're not going too far astray. We also compare, generally at this point in my business, we have a contract, uh, so we also like to compare the features that we're drawing with the statement of work that we've um, signed or, or are about to sign with our client. Make sure everyone signs off. We should have a little signature box down here. Um, and we take a photo of this and we put it in Slack, which is our beloved tool for communication. Next up is the architecture. So one thing I've gotta tell you, um, especially if you're non-technical and you're looking to build an app, is that most developers, not all, but most developers do not know how to properly architect an app. And so my advice is to find a professional architect or use this process so that you can use lower cost developers in the next steps. Again, our process is all about making the important decisions up front and then really going into code monkey mode as time goes on. Uh, developers often really hate this step. Um, my, my favorite developer is not a big fan of the architecture. He likes to just wing it. So it's something to be wary of. That's where our PM, which is usually me, can really come in and just make sure we've got these decisions made properly so that we're not making critical mistakes that we're being paid for later. Normally, we get to a point where everyone's sick of doing the architecture, and then I request that we do another 10%, or I just do it myself. It's an extra hour or two, really pays off later when we are knee deep in development. So <clears throat> now we're doing screens and flows again, except this time with a lot more detail. Not so much on the design elements, the drawings per se, but a lot more on the how does data flow? What really, what is the name of this view controller? Um, what are the underlying models? What are the views that we haven't yet discovered that we need to build um, in a custom fashion? Are there any model controllers, which we often call data managers, that we need to be building? And there almost always are, um, because there's something that needs to talk to the server, um, if there's a server. We also, at this point, again, we take another pen color, and we identify key places where we know we want analytics. And this is information that we've often extracted from um, the client. And so we know where to go and say, hey, this is a key point for analytics. So that way when we're doing development, we don't have to guess, we know exactly where it goes. We also finalize the technical test list and start to really perform those, um, especially if we're really worried about any. Continue researching open source code and start to zoom in on the models themselves because we need to do that information architecture or information design, like I mentioned earlier. Really start to think about what are the important properties of our model? Um, who's allowed to set them? Who's allowed to read them? Who isn't? Um, this is a very important step for avoiding really nasty bugs that can happen when you've got, especially in a, in a language like Objective-C, um, where you've got um, objects being passed all over the place to all sorts of different controllers, and oftentimes if the properties aren't set right, anyone can edit them and swap data out from underneath another view controller or another controller that's also in touch with that object. Swift is gonna fix a lot, Swift has fixed a lot of these issues, but this is a really key step for us make sure we know who has permission to edit the data that this map is sitting on, this app is sitting on top of. We also, <clears throat> there's this traditional MVC model, um, model view controller. Um, we've sort of added our own fourth element, which we call operations. It's kind of a mix between model and controller. Um, this would be something like a call to the network, something very ephemeral where it's created, it's, something happens to it, maybe it fires itself off, um, and a call comes back, and then it sort of deletes itself. We don't really like how that fits into the MVC model, so we often create sort of another paradigm um, where we have an O for uh, operations and sometimes operation controllers. This next screen, D5, is the high-res architecture, and again, we start to focus a little bit less on the actual graphic design and user interface and a lot more on the flow of data, because here's where all the gotchas are. This is what separates um, app designers like myself and, and the folks that work in my company <clears throat> from graphic designers. Graphic designers can take your idea and make it look extremely pretty, and you will fall in love with the PDFs that they send you back. However, when we get these PDFs, they're almost useless to us because they've not been thought through in the process that I've just outlined. So there's, no quite, there's not a lot of thought that's gone into, well, how does the user get back from this screen to here? What happens, I see this all the time, this is my test. <clears throat> what happens if there's a, a uh, a tab bar at the bottom of the app, 
and then the user taps somewhere on the screen and a keyboard's deployed. Well, now the keyboard is covering that tab bar. And that's one of those like really key gotchas that people that don't actually build apps miss 80, 90% of the time. So these are the kinds of things we look, we look for when a client comes to us and says, hey, we're, we're ready to start development. We've got, uh, we've got the designs totally done. We go through our process because if we don't, we tend to find that they're not ready and we end up bearing the burden of that. So really recommend up until this point to really be very patient with the process, invest the extra time, because the development actually goes fairly quickly once you've thought through um, the early steps and you've trimmed down the app to a reasonable size. <clears throat> so again, we sketch and label, we draw the flows, uh, we do the first launch again, often for the last time, uh, we identify the models for the view controllers, so we're kind of just repeating this process, but again, in a more and more and more technical fashion, right? So we've already gotten very precise, and now we're making our way across to being very technical. <clears throat> identify the technical test, have folks sign off, take that photo, upload it to both Asana, which is our task management tool of choice, especially for developers, and Slack. <clears throat> Next up is what we call the class legend. This is, a this is just a boring list, actually, of all the different classes in the app. Um, we give them a name, we list the model, we talk about the data flow, who can set the data, who can read the data, what features this view controller might have. We like to organize our apps by screens because it's very intuitive to us as humans. Um, we compare this with the high res architecture that was the previous page, um, and we update anything we need to there. We also compare it again with the statement of work, so what our spec is, get everyone to sign off, <coughs> take a photo, upload it. This is the last screen that we typically need. We do run off uh, blank blu blueprints um, in case anything weird comes up, which sometimes happens when you're designing a HIPAA compliant chat app. Um, we do the final architecture. And all this is is a copy from the high res to the final, something that we can put up on the wall and we can talk, talk about you know, as we're running into issues during development. It's just a clean copy of the high res architecture. Chapter four, develop. Running a little short on time, so I think I'm gonna speed it up. <clears throat> this is the whole step where we start to implement all the decisions we've made. We should be done making decisions at this point. If the developer has to make decisions, it slows the, the process down and we start to make mistakes. I'll put up some resources for good places to find quality developers and advice on how to vet them. One thing I would, one piece of advice I'll give you now is don't worry about firing your developer. Don't worry about using developer A to do the architecture and using another developer B to do the actual implementation. That's actually one of the smartest ways to do it. And when we build our apps internally, even though we use the same developers in San Francisco, really high-end guys, um, they're my good friends, we, uh, and occasionally I'll jump in as well and do some development, we really separate those tasks, the architecture from the development. So don't be afraid to bring two different people in. Setting up the project is oh so important. If you get out of the gate with the wrong Xcode settings, you are setting up you are asking for weeks of headache um, on longer projects. <clears throat> uh, setting up the class interfaces, so this is how the different classes talk to one another, uh, what the effectively SDKs or APIs are between them. Starting to stub out code that's more difficult. Um, and then it's really rolling right into implementing features. And again, once you stub out the difficult code, you can often find less expensive developers to do the bulk of the rest of the lifting. We call this code monkey mode. This is like a code monkey ninja. Um, that everyone in the valley is looking for. Debugging, the, the lost art and science of debugging. Um, and then of course, quality assurance and testing. This is super important. I actually have a lot of really interesting techniques around letting the client find some bugs. Um, and it brings them back into the process after us going sort of silent for two or three days. I'm happy to talk about that offline or in some of the posts I've written. And then of course, troubleshooting developers, like I said, don't be afraid to let developers go. Debugging, I'm just gonna briefly cover this. You can actually read it faster than I can talk about it. But I find that when developers are starting to get tired, they start to get irrational, not irrational, illogical about the way they track down bugs. And so we like to, if we need to, print this out and go through a challenging bug through with a process, right? Because it's not that the developer is not smart, it's that they're tired, right? And they're not thinking straight. And they're thinking, if I just slam my head against this problem for three more minutes, I'll figure it out. But if you just go through these extremely simple steps, you will, I guarantee you, find 90 plus percent of the bugs that have ever been created. Just by simply identifying the bug, the solution will reveal itself. Chapter five, launch and market. Preparing an app for the app store is an art in and of itself. Um, 
we allocate three to six hours to do this, even though we've done it dozens of times. Um, I have a really good resource for uh, especially first time um, product managers and developers for getting your um, terms of service uh, and privacy policy straightened out. I'll include that for like nine bucks a year or something like that. There's a website where you just click on all the services you're using and they will generate your privacy policy. The reason this is important is because Apple will reject your app if you're using functionality and don't have it mentioned in your privacy policy. This is a thing that we've learned over the years and can save you a ton of time because if you get rejected by Apple, you're looking at a uh, delay of anywhere between six and eight days, um, depending on the time of year. Submitting for review. It's gotten easier over the years, but it's still very complicated. I know a lot of developers who have never shipped an app to the App Store. So if you're bringing in another developer, don't assume they've done this. I like to take this moment after shipping an app to go back and clean up GitHub or whatever your uh, code repository of choice is and get a little bit organized. Save that version off to the side because one day you're gonna need it. You're gonna say, hey, we wanted that feature in version one that we deleted in version two and now it's version four and it's really hard to go get um, if you don't have your Git uh, set up properly. App Store uh, troubles, if Apple's rejecting your app, um, try a few times and then just give me a call. I've seen everything. Um, we just got an app through after 12 submissions we got it through, and then in the next update, they rejected us again. We will get this app through eventually, I guarantee it. Um, Apple has their weak spots here, and we know what they are. It's just persistence. <clears throat> Launching your app and marketing it to your first users. We're at the point now where we've seen enough apps that we really don't wanna work with folks who don't have a list of 100 or 200 people that they're gonna twist their arms to download the app and play with. Because what's the point? You know, if you're gonna spend tens of thousands of dollars to get an app built, which is inexpensive um, in the grand scheme of things, if you're not willing to either spend the money to advertise it or knock on the doors of your friends and say, hey, download this thing that I'm excited about, then there's something wrong with the way you're thinking about your app. It's not really that important to you. So it's really important to get these first 100 or 1,000 users and to have thought through this fairly well. This is a question that we ask very early on. Chapter six, improvement and maintenance. One of the major goals of this step is to support our users so that we don't lose them. So we have to listen, which can be really hard when your baby is on the line and you feel like people are attacking it. So this is something that we sometimes do on behalf of our clients. Lots of great tools. Forgot to mention one um, for um, collecting feedback and bugs in beta tests. We use tools like uh, Crashlytics, which is kind of called Fabric now, which is owned by Twitter, to automatically generate crash reports for us. Highly recommend it. It's a great example of beautiful web design that is terribly uh, non-functional, um, but the tool is great. I see some laughing out there. Um, the Twitter guys are great, though, uh, the team that works on that. Um, we brought down one of their servers one day, and they were up all night working on, on something for us. So they're, that, that, the Fabric team is really awesome. We really like them a lot. So that product is great. And they have some other great products side by side with that. Another one for uh, bug reporting from your beta users. Um, there's one called Instabug, and there's one called Bug Clipper. We're kind of going back and forth between the two of them. They're really cool, though. You take your uh, device, if you find a bug, and just shake it, and it either takes a screenshot or a video, and then you kind of can draw on top of it to say, like, hey, this image it didn't load right or whatever, and then it goes straight to the developers, and we have it hooked up with Slack and Asana, so it's filed as a bug in Asana, and it goes straight into our Slack chat, and so everyone gets to see what's going on. Those are really cool features. The, the other nice thing is we build in a little code around it so that we can turn it on and off, so when we're tired of getting feedback from the client, we just turn it off. Um, so our developers can get back to work without being interrupted by uh, you know, dozens of bug reports. So they still come in, but we don't get the uh, notifications. So fixing bugs is obviously a huge part of maintenance. And when you're working on an insane uh, timeline, you wanna get these bugs turned around really quickly. What we do in our contracts is after the seven day sprint, we give our clients between two and five hours of additional work over the next 30 days to tackle the really critical bugs. And then we automatically enroll them in a maintenance plan um, at that point going forward. Of course, understanding and decoding analytics. Um, again, I didn't mention it here, but I'll put it on the website. There's a whole bunch of great analytics tools out there. Mixpanel just um, probably a year ago reduced their prices substantially. And like if you include like a little ad from them on your website, like a little powered by Mixpanel or something, you can get like 4X the, um, 
interactions that they uh, typically give you. The mix panel, which used to be out of range for most startups and small companies, is now back in range in terms of pricing. Um, Parse, which we like a lot for our back end as a service, has an analytics platform that's okay, um, especially if you set it up properly. You get a fair amount for free, though, which uh, we like. Um, so, but understanding the analytics is very important here. And so if you haven't built them properly from the start, then you're not gonna, you're not gonna really decode what's going on. This is where mixed panel is, is very powerful, especially if you need funneling to understand what's going on. So the user does X, and then Y, and then A, and then B, and then C. If you want that kind of funnel, you've really gotta go with something powerful like mixed panel. Um, Parse just doesn't have this functionality yet. <clears throat> of course, making course corrections um, and continuing ongoing development. What we do uh, on our end at my company is we offer everything from just critical crash support all the way to ongoing development um, with a half-time engineer or more. And of course, optimizing, especially around um, monetization, is a huge part at this uh, stage. Once you have about 1,000 users, you can really start to use some optimization tools um, to help you make decisions. So just to recap here a little bit, um, we've got a couple different tools that we use. Um, the six-step process, define, design, architect, develop, deploy, and maintain, um, broken up into these sort of broader sections of make all the decisions, execute on the decisions you've made, and then go and deliver, and then we just turn right back around and go up to the front with our next sprint. I think right now in the Valley, there's a lot of hype around agile development, and when people see our model, they sometimes say, well, this is just the old school waterfall method, and I think what people don't realize is that all agile is is waterfall done repeatedly and rapidly. That's the same model that we have. Tool on the top left, we like to get as precise as we can and then very technical. It's not a straight up and then a straight right. Um, it's a bit of an iterative process. Um, we find this very important to moving quickly so that once we get into the development stage, we can really just code monkey crank away. So now I task you to go out and build. The world needs you to solve some real problems and have a few less, or uh, a handful less dog and cat pictures. Um, so you'll find these slides and all these other tools and all the ones I mentioned um, throughout the presentation, including a, a few I didn't mention, um, human-centered design from IDEO, Kano's model of product development. This is really cool, um, especially if you're uh, starting to just get into product development. It's, it's good theory on features and what users' expectations are. All of this will be online. Um, at metagear.com, Silicon Valley Code Camp SVCC15. I think those have to be lowercase, so double check that. Um, and it's not online yet. Uh, the slides are, our older, slightly older version of them are. Um, but as soon as you uh, sign up on the site, all this stuff, uh, once I populate it, I'll send it out in an email and get it out to you. I've got some really good books on Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, again, Mike Montiero, uh, Design is a Job, especially if you're a designer or you're getting into design, I really recommend this book. And Mike has a great sense of humor. I think in like the 10th sentence of the book, he says that I, I wrote this book, notice that it has a spine, by the end of it you will too. So I, I really like his approach to design and how it's a job. And because again, I see myself as a designer, as someone who solves problems, I, I got a lot of value out of it. <clears throat> I have a lot of extremely practical advice online as well. This stuff's all live if you just go to my website on how to cut features, I have a series on how to cut features and, and deal with clients and project managers who are trying to stuff more into a project and how to go about doing that. There's a lot of people management there. Um, how to iterate. There's actually really good science on this from the late 80s. Um, smart brain versus dumb brain. Um, a British fellow whose last name is Emberton has some really good pieces on this on Quora. Um, energy management during, during sprints. People assume that we don't sleep at all, um, that we're wired on caffeine the whole time. It's just not the case. We've actually learned quite a bit about how to manage our energy. And it really starts with getting enough sleep or, or at least a suitable amount and really with food, um, eating real food, not junk food. That's how we sustain ourselves through these insane sprints, code review, and all sorts of other stuff online that you can read about. And I think I'm gonna open it up to questions now. Here's some contact information from me. Um, I think that is the end of the presentation. So feel, like I said, feel free to sign up here to get uh, the slides and um, reach out to me in any form you want. I've got cards up here, and if you've got a few minutes, I can show you some real blueprints that I wasn't able to show in these public slides.